Hi, and welcome to Freedom Fighters Code Grey. This is a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's taking place locally, but that's also taking place around the world. Today, I have with me a very special guest, Anna Lucia Mariaka, who's going to be addressing some really important questions as it relates to human trafficking. Who is trafficked around the world? And specifically, why are men and boys being trafficked? What research is being done to understand the trafficking of men and boys around the world? We're going to shed light on this topic in today's discussion. And so I'm so glad that we have a trauma-informed human security researcher with a specialization in survivors of human trafficking, sexual exploitation, and child abuse. Welcome, Anna Lucia. Thank you so much for having me, Michaela. It's such a pleasure to be on your show today. Well, just to get started, I was wondering if you could tell our viewers and our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got to be involved in anti-trafficking research. Yes, of course. Um, So I am a researcher and advocate for human trafficking cases and child sexual abuse cases. Um, My work pretty much started working on uh, the Canadian members of parliament um, with statistical research, policy writing, human rights advocacy work. I created a database to help Bill C-310 pass. And so that bill um, makes sure that Canadians that go overseas to abuse children or do anything with human trafficking um, can get arrested upon arrival back into Canada. I also worked with NGOs and frontline uh, work with victims of trafficking and vulnerable communities. This led me to uh, also do some work at Interpol. Uh, overseas, which in similar fields and topics. And then in the last few years, I've created this research project and has and have been interviewing uh, male survivors over the course of the last year. Wow, you have done so much work already and so much important research, but also policy work. I didn't know that you were involved in that important legislation that was passed here in Canada. So thank you for being an advocate and helping to create legislation that better protects Canadians and children around the world. That's really amazing. Um, Anna Lucia, I was wondering, you mentioned that right now you're currently working on this research project that involves male survivors. Can you tell us a little bit about what is this project and what does it all entail? Yes, of course. So the research focuses on uh, male victim identification um, as children. And so I'm interviewing uh, adult male survivors, but this has happened in their childhood. So it is focusing on what indicators were there that a lot of people have missed from families to school to ER staff, police, therapists, as well as their unique needs um, afterwards, after their experience of child sexual exploitation. Uh, For example, um, do they need support with therapy, with safe homes, Uh, what has been important in their healing process, and what has really hindered their healing process as well. That's such an important study that you're undertaking. For lots of people, when they hear the word research, I think people have like a lot of assumptions or stereotypes in their mind about like what research is and how that research process goes. Can you help unpack a little bit about your methodology? How do you actually undertake this study? What does it look like on the ground for you to do this research? Yeah, of course. So this has been a long time in the making. Uh, It took about one year to get just the ethics approval for it because it's such a vulnerable community. Um, After getting that ethics approval, we worked on, uh, well, I worked with my team for doing interviews with um, about 40 male survivors across Canada and the United States, as well as a few abroad, just to listen to their stories. So this pretty much consisted of um, like four hour meetings with some interviews, um, just listening to their stories, their traumas, and then uh, also reviewing their questions and answers afterwards on um, the actual uh, thesis itself, which is on their, their needs and, um, and, and what they need afterwards as well. So when you're saying you interviewed 40 survivors, what does that interview process look like? I'm just thinking like, you know, you hear the word interview and you're thinking like it's super formal, but you're saying this could take up to four hours. So what is the kind of dynamic in the room when you're with an individual, how do you create a safe space where there's mutual trust amongst you as a researcher and this individual with lived experience? And um, what kinds of questions are you asking to learn about their stories and experiences in a way that will help inform your study? 
So for my research study, uh, the, the four hour interviews pretty much consist of just letting them know that it's a safe space to share their stories. And this is where COVID-19 actually came into my advantage. Uh, normally I would have done these interviews face, by, uh, face to face and going to hometowns and you know renting out a room to do this in, but because of COVID everything went online and uh, Zoom was actually very beneficial uh, for these interviews and it, it automatically created that safe space because that person could be in their, in their room, they could have their water next to them, they could take their breaks, they can do um, whatever they needed to to feel safe and comfortable. And so they didn't need to leave a center for everyone to know that they were interviewed or crying or things like that. And so um, that was very great with like the online forum to create that safe space. And so that kind of led to an easier uh, act of disclosure. So they knew that they could trust me because I had spent about a year creating that trust with the community of male survivors. And it slowly accelerated until I went from one to 40 so quickly um, because they really do encourage each other, especially using um, online chat forums such as Male Survivor and by partnering with uh, organizations like Male Survivor and Men's Healing, Matrix Men, they were able to encourage their survivors to uh, reach out and talk to me and know that it's safe, know that whatever they tell me is confidential, and then only be used for patterns and for analysis later on. And so this was very useful for creating that safe environment for them to know that whatever they had told me um, as deep into their topic or as, as um, little information that whatever they said uh, would be beneficial to help the next person. I really appreciate just so much of your approach as a researcher to help ensure that it is a safe space. And I love how you pointed out that someone could be in their own home environment and be comfortable and have a glass of water and take breaks when they need to. And um, that you were kind of working from this trauma-informed lens, which is so critical when we do research with vulnerable population groups, but especially with individuals who have experienced trafficking, we want to ensure that they feel empowered um, in the research process. And I know that you're doing that so well. So thanks for just you know, all the thoughtfulness that you're taking in your process and in your methodology. So when it comes to actually listening to these stories and analyzing findings, what are some of the things that you've learned about how men and boys experience trafficking? So this was quite interesting because in a lot of the data that has been collected so far, um, there is a very big survivor bias. And this is, if it's not seen, then it's not really counted. Um, so this has led to a lot of uh, gaps in, um, in information and not really understanding the, the whole situation. And so by going down to the very center of it in the core of interviewing survivors, it has led to so much insight on, um, on, on what to, to learn from them. And so I've, I've learned that um, their, their disclosure has so many different factors to it, whether it is society, uh, the stigma that is attached to it, uh, toxic masculinity, as well as um, their own complex PTSD, minimal support systems being around, and even knowing that they won't be believed, a lot of these survivors disclose between seven to 11 times before finally someone believes them. Wow. And this can be from... Um, ER staff to police officers to to anyone as children and then even as adults and so we can really see that it, it seems like everything is stacked against them uh, and so this is why the, the research was so important to understand these barriers but as well as how can we address them properly and so it also showed me that um, and the trauma-informed care was so uh, essential for really understanding and, and making sure that you create that safe space for, for everyone, um, as well as that um, there's so many different forms of trafficking and sexual abuse. And in plain sight, for example, I've heard about community pedophile rings where family uh, do this form of trafficking and the child could literally sleep in their own bed, go to school, go to their community groups and still be in a trafficked situation. Um, and so 
it has really opened my eyes to understand what trafficking is, the intensity of it, and, and just how it can be so hidden um, in our society. That fact that you shared is sitting so heavy with me that an individual who identifies as male will disclose seven to 10 times before there's someone who believes them. What do you think is something concrete that can be done to address that bias? Because even like as we talk about trafficking, we always talk about women and girls, women and girls, women and girls. And we have these stats that demonstrate it's majority women and girls, but is that because of the bias? Like, so how do we start to tackle that as a society? So I completely agree with you about this bias. And I feel like that's really controlling our society, just these social narratives that we that we want to believe in. And we have this very big, you know, males are perpetrators, females are victims. And that really dictates a lot, whether it's who's counted as a statistic of trafficking victim or a criminal, or who's getting the support, who's getting safe homes. And so I think we really need to uh, change our, our societal viewpoints on males, uh, that they can be victims, that, that they do need support, and they do need to be believed as well. And this is going to be a long-term process, because of course we can't change our communities so quickly, but I think by raising awareness like we are doing on this show right now, we're showing um, other male survivors out there that you know the, the process has started, the change is coming, and people are you know, now on their side and believing them. There's international community groups. There is so much now, there's support now that there wasn't 20, 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. I love how you just said the process has started and change is coming. And this change is so critical and dire in order to address the issue of trafficking of persons, because as you said, there are men and there are boys who have experienced trafficking who are in need of support. Well, Ana Lucia, it is just such a privilege to learn from you today. And I'm so grateful for the important work that you're undertaking. We're going to come back right after a short break. I'll be taking down four of Bayview's biggest offenders. Let's just say I've got enough dirt to bury them. Nobody at the school would get called out for anything if it weren't for me. Simon? <coughs> Jesus, he's allergic. I don't think he's breathing. You want to help? They think one of us did it. Wasn't it an accident? Detective Wheeler he has a couple questions. Everybody here hated him. One of Us is Lying, all new. Wednesdays, only on W. Focus better. Partner better. Sleep better. Breathe better. Love better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Everything gets better when you get active. And welcome back to Freedom Fighters Code Grey, a show where we discuss human trafficking, an issue that's happening locally and globally. Today, I have with me Anna Lucia Mariaca, a researcher who's shedding light on how men and boys experience trafficking in North America. Anna, I've learned so much from you already in this show, and I was wondering if you could just give us a high-level overview of what it is that you are undertaking in this research and what questions that you're addressing through it. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. And so what I'm really looking into this research is uh, male survivors and victims of human trafficking and sexual exploitation as children. So this is a very big gap in the literature, um, in academics, but as well in media, in policy and all over the world. Uh, so this is why I really wanted to take it on because I love filling in things that um, no one really knows about. And so this has really led me to speak with a lot of survivors uh, on, online, of course, not face to face, but it has really kind of made that connection into understanding their lives and their needs. Um, what do they need after trauma? Um, what has really hindered their healing and what has really helped 
but as well, what are those indicators, uh, behavioral or something that they're showing as children that really could have supported them, that could have helped them, but everyone missed at the time or ignored. So those were the big things, a part of my research that hopefully can really help someone in the future. So in response to those questions that you outlined, and after you've undertaken all of these interviews, what are the findings from your research? What are you discovering? What has been a surprise? Tell us. <laughs> okay, so to learn the whole thing, you are obviously going to need to wait for the research report to come out. However, the, the findings that what I was most surprised about was actually, um, I'll name two. So female perpetrators were the first one and trauma-informed practices and the importance of them was number two. Um, so to go back to female perpetrators, we have this social narrative that women are kind and caring, compassionate mothers. And this is what we always hope to see in, in women. And, and so when something comes against that, for example, a female perpetrator, whether it's a, an abuser, a trafficker, or a buyer, um, someone committing these crimes, it, it's something that our society just doesn't know how to handle uh, that kind of fact. And so from doing my research, um, from the abuse cases, especially from mothers, uh, this was about 50% of all my cases. So 50% of them had mothers, aunts, uh, cousins that were committing the abuse against these children. And then once you also add trafficking, this jumps up to 60% in the cases. So that means that they're abusers, they're traffickers, and they're also buyers. And sometimes they can be even more abusive than the men because they're less likely to be caught or prosecuted. And this fact has really come to light when a survivor is trying to tell their story, for example, to a police officer. Um, we have a case in Canada where an adult male was trying to disclose to a police officer his abuse. And she said, this can't be right. This is against our statistics. I don't believe you. And so dropped the case, left, and just never kind of went back to that. And that just yeah. shows you how much this societal uh, narrative has really been ingrained to, to think, you know, women can only be victims, they cannot be perpetrators, when in reality, anyone could be a perpetrator, anyone could be a trafficker, anyone could be a buyer. It does not have a gender. And this all really comes down to, you know, money, power, uh, corruption. And so those were, uh, that's really big finding. And then another one was uh, the importance of trauma-informed practices. So in uh, two different situations, I had an individual where um, as a child, they're going into the ER, they have all the, the indicators of abuse, of trafficking, and uh, a nurse in the RSF actually stood up for the child and said, we have to really investigate. They have these signs and actually ended up rescuing that child from trafficking. And so that shows you the importance of being trauma informed. Um, where on the other hand, we have another situation where again, a child comes into the ER full of you know, cuts and bruises and is telling the doctor, disclosing, you know, I'm not safe, please save me. And then they actually are returned right back to their trafficker. And so this really just shows you when someone is trauma informed and knows the indicators on how, um, what a child is, you know, saying and behaving versus someone that may not be, um, or kind of ignoring the signs or just, you know, passing through things quickly. And then it just shows you that um, it can lead to early identification and even rescue of children in these situations. Wow, these findings are so significant. And even I'm thinking about how they layer um, with one another in terms of how does that social narrative actually impact people's ability in a, you know, a service provider role or in, in a hospital or ER, for example, like how does that social narrative that they have that, you know, men are the perpetrators and women can't be abusers influence their ability to detect those indicators because they're coming from that position um, of bias, so to speak. So, I mean, you mentioned the social narrative that's being carried forward and 
um, dismantling that to be like, anyone can be trafficked and anyone can be a trafficker. Anyone can be an abuser, regardless of, you know, age, gender, sex, ethnicity. So how do we begin to, as you know, we're still, I feel like on the, the early stages of raising awareness on this issue in the first place, like some people still don't even believe that it's happening in our communities at all. So how do we now tackle this further by raising awareness on this social view that's taking place that is actually furthering perpetuating harm as it relates to men and boys who are experiencing exploitation. So just like you said, it is to raise awareness. That is the very first step. I remember when I was working with um, former member of parliament, Joy Smith, not even 10 years ago. And the whole point was raising awareness because then that leads to change in in um, society, in policy. And then that's how we actually got the the new law to make trafficking even illegal in the first place. And that was not even 10 years ago in Canada. And so the same thing will need to happen with uh, with men and boys, but then even you can go even further in that and, you know, into marginalized groups, into LGBTQ, into people of color, into the indigenous communities, disabilities, refugees, you know, we need to really bring awareness to, um, you know, to all of these groups, men and boys and everyone else, because if not, then you know, we can keep living our lives and never know that this exists. And and I think by creating that social awareness is just the very first step because we always, you know, we have um, short, medium and long term goals in, in this field from, you know, the first step can be raising awareness, having education. And the next step is, you know, changing that community mindset so that they know that uh, men can be victimized, that they're not always the perpetrators. And then this can hopefully you know, cause some healing and some change in the society. And then hopefully that can then lead to uh, more safe homes for men, more community groups, uh, more police officers aware that this happens, more ER staff that aware, even uh, therapists, you know, give them more training that this, uh, that this even happens. And so it's one of those, it's going to take a long process, but I think by talking about it today is really one of those those big first steps or those initial steps to really get the ball moving in the right direction. Earlier, you mentioned how there was one individual who worked in a hospital who identified the signs and was able to help a child exit a situation of trafficking. When men and boys exit trafficking, um, there's a term that you use in your research that I think is really interesting. It's called a journey to survivorhood. So what does that journey to survivorhood look like for an individual who's exited a situation of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation? And also, what do you think is needed to come alongside that individual to help them in their healing journey? What support services are needed um, still, like, or what exists, but what's also lacking? Perfect. And so when it comes to this lifelong journey, um, it's going to be quite difficult for, for anyone involved. And I think the biggest thing is that the survivor even actually survived that situation. Um, well, I know we have these like stats of, you know, this many people are in, in trafficking, but those are just, again, the survivor bias of those we see and those we have heard those stories from. And the rest of them might have never disclosed or might have not even made it and survived that situation. And so anyone coming out of trafficking or abuse or finally disclose, uh, disclosing, we have to remember that abusers, traffickers, they've used so many grooming tactics, and this means manipulation, threats, torture. Um, and this is just to create this situation where there's potentially Stockholm syndrome or um, just a situation where they, they tell you that anyone that's trying to help is dangerous. And so this can really cause that individual or that child to constantly return back to, to trafficking or to their abuser because they don't know any other, um, an, other way that's their life that they have known. Um, so many, many trafficking uh, victims actually return back numerous times. It is never just, you know, leaving and they've left. It, it's always a lifelong journey to, to finally get to that point where they're, they feel safe enough to disclose and to talk to that social worker, that police officer, and then going on. And so there's really mainly two routes that they could take, either 
be silent forever and they feel like they're in a cage and never seek help. And then this could lead to, you know, addictions, alcohol abuse, bad relationships, and just an overall sense of dismay throughout their life. Or they could seek help if they're, you know, able to. And so this is also in associating with potentially having Stockholm syndrome or complex PTSD dissociation. And so it's going to be a hard process to go through all of this. And so as um, as people, as allies, as friends, the best thing that we can do at the very beginning is to listen, to care about them, to really believe them, um, not just to listen, but to actively listen and, and to see what, how can I help you instead of just throwing this will help, this will help. But, you know, what are ways that you feel supported mm -hmm. and encourage them to seek that help, whether it is through community groups, um, online forums, therapy, but it it will be um, a lifelong journey to recovery and then hopefully to thriving afterwards. I love how you just kind of helped shed light on each individual is an individual with unique needs. And so we need to actively listen and ask the question, what do you need? What, what does support look like to you and how can I come alongside you? Um, I think that's really amazing instead of, you know, kind of coming in with our own ideas of what this person might need. As we wrap up our time together today, I was wondering if there was anything else that you would like to add. Yes, thank you so much. So I just wanted to let any survivor out there know that things are changing. There are NGOs, there's international uh, communities, there's safe online chat forms for interacting that can be anonymous. There's healing retreats in person and online, webinars, live events for sharing your stories. There's international hotlines. And there's great organizations like Male Survivor, Matrix Men, One in Six, Men's Healing, the Men's Story Project that give uh, men and boys the opportunity to be uh, heard, to heal, and then to thrive. Um, and so for anyone else out there, remember, check your bias, be an ally. And, um, and all this could have really only been done through the support of the survivors that were a part of this research. Um, the experts, as well as um, the other organizations that help supported this research from Male Survivor, Hard Places Community, Up International, and many, many more. And so thank you for, for you and for everyone else that has supported this research so far. Well, Anna Lucia, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge, insights, and expertise on this topic, but also for the ways that you're advocating for um, individuals who have been impacted by trafficking for advocating on behalf of male and male survivors. So thank you for the work that you're doing. It's so critically important and for helping to shed light on this injustice to help prevent exploitation from happening, but also to help connect survivors with existing resources and supports. If you're tuning in the show today and you're in immediate danger, uh, please call 911 if it's safe to do so. Um, if you're looking for resources and support as it relates to human trafficking, you can call the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline that's available 24-7 at 1-833-900-1010. Again, that's 1-833-900-1010. We're going to have links to resources and different hotlines nationally and internationally if you are from outside of the country and needing resources and supports today. But thank you so much for taking the time to tune into Freedom Fighters Code Grey, and we hope to catch you next time. Thank you.